Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guests this week are named the Signposter and Troy of Is. And uh, these are not their, you know, birth names, obviously, um, but they are the names that they choose to be uh, referred to in this interview. And um, it's not unusual, of course, for people to assume spiritual names of some sort, Adyashanti, Gangaji, many, pe many teachers do this. Um, but I was curious and thought maybe I would start with the question of what is the significance of these names? What, what do they each mean? Well, uh, I guess I'll st start. Uh, mm -hmm. Troy, this, you know, medieval times? Yeah. Well, this would, I'm so and so of Sir Lancelot. Right, yeah. Um, well, of is just means like of. Isness? Well, reality or. Being or something? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's a name, I got the name Troy from this time poster. Okay, good. And how about the sign poster? Why? What does that mean exactly? It's um, <clears throat> Rick. It's um, pretty obvious. The name itself um, is to point to point back at the inquirer. Mm -hmm. um, so that to 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 break that tendency or habitual way of uh, inquirers and seekers tend to look outside for answers rather than being silent and quiet down and test test their answers out inside. Hmm. So your function is to be a, a stimulus or an impetus for people to do that, to look within for the answers rather than relying on external sources or authorities. Is that correct? Yeah. Even, even if I find myself... Um, answering a question I that that is not to be taken as as an answer mm -hmm. it's used as a stimulus for working inside uh-huh okay good so um, I first became aware of you guys actually it was first you Troy where you posted some inter some something on YouTube where you're lambasting gurus in general and I thought, boy, this guy has an attitude. And but it was sort of you were presenting it in an intelligent way. And uh, then I kind of forgot about you. And then later on, you got in touch with me, I believe, and, and we started talking about doing this interview. And since then, I've listened to, you know, several things that I was able to to locate, um, including your your interview with Trip Overholt that you did just recently after I had interviewed him. And uh, so I have a better sense of what you're all about and I've read the the table of contents of the sign posters book it's like a 500 page book and I'd like to be able to go through some of the points I uh, in that book with with you and with the sign poster but um, maybe we could just clear the air a little bit about this gurus thing I uh, my feeling was that you painted them a little bit with too broad a brush um, in other words, a lot of generalization about gurus are all money grubbers and there's no genuine ones living today and so on and so forth. And I, I kind of beg to differ with those observations, but I respect you know, your, your right to have that opinion, if, if such is your opinion. But um, let's, let's talk about gurus a little bit and why maybe both or either of you feel that um, they've, they're, they're ripping people off, if that's what you feel. Uh, the what? Your question is why they're doing it. Um, well, uh, first of all, maybe are they all doing it? Do you really feel like all gurus today or spiritual teachers are disingenuous? Uh, they're all just in it for the money, or do you feel that there's you know maybe a, a spectrum, and and some are are really rip off artists, but some of them are really quite genuine, and and a lot of them are somewhere in between. Probably that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, this organism is only going on intuitions in hearing them and seeing them, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, which uh, which uh, I trust quite strongly. Mm -hmm. I can pick things up very very well, but obviously they're they're 
probably are genuine human beings who are doing the guru game uh, signposting. Um, so sure, but but I you you can't say that we had a great sample because there there's probably maybe thousands of gurus today. It's not like the old days when they were ver they were they seemed to be very rare. Although we have to remember, Lao Tzu disappeared. There's all kinds of gurus perhaps that disappeared. They don't bother to bother with the game of signposting because often they think it's futile. Also, Lao Tzu and Jesus and Buddha and all of them lived in a day when we were far from having anything like the internet. And, um, you know, there could have been spiritual teachers sprinkled all over the world that we have no way of remembering. But actually, if you look at all the ancient cultures of the world, there are, in fact, you know, records of teachers of various kinds, you know, spiritual teachers in, in all ancient cultures, from Egypt to, you know, the, the Mayans and, you know, what have you. So it does seem to be something that's characteristic of any age. There are going to be people who are going to be, you know, assuming the role of spiritual teachers. Would, would you not agree to that? Yeah, but I think, um, I think Rick, that we're in, we're in rather unique times mm -hmm. uh, where, where um, you know, people are very desperate today. They're really frightened. And so they're looking for, like, as people do, they're looking for great authority figures that will calm them down, give them a sense of security, and a, and a deep sense that they're going to survive. So they're looking for that. And that's a good game to play because, man, if you can get people hooked in that direction, you've got them. You've got a great industry. So if you'll notice, that's my slant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it harkens back to what you were saying in the beginning in defining your name, that um, a lot of people do tend to look to external sources rather than within themselves. But um, the good teachers, I would say, or maybe we could agree on a, on a definition of a good teacher, would be one which, who, who is telling the person, hey, don't just listen to me. Find you know, within yourself the experience of the, what I'm talking about because the words aren't going to do it for you. I'm, I'm referring to an experience which I have had and which I want you to have. Most teachers that I know of that I consider legitimate are saying something like that. Yeah, and I would also tag on to the word experience, radical standing. You know, understanding which comes from the root. Just understanding, I, I, I explain it this way, to stand under and see from the root up holistically. Mm -hmm. So that's what, that's what I encourage. I think I got your point, but your audio broke up a little bit, so uh, and it's kind of intermittent at the moment. Oh, dear. Uh, but we got most of it. So you were just saying that, um, we'll say it again, just so we make sure we have it. Well, what I encourage the inquirer to do is to stand under what's being said and see, examine from the root up holistically. Mm-hmm. And stand under, and, and it's interestingly enough, the word radical is related to the word root, but stand under me. So, so I guess what you're saying is you really uh, want them to experience under, what's being said. Yeah, totally, holistically, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than understand just cognitively. Correct. And really, I'd say that um, most any spiritual teacher worth his salt is advocating just that. You know, they, you know, they're, they're going to say, don't just read books and listen to talks. You have to experience what's being discussed here or it's not going to do you any good. You know, it's like, like, you know, reading a cookbook is you could starve to death doing that. You need the actual experience of what it's referring to. Yeah. Um, the point is, though, here, here's the problem. When you say, I want you to understand or stand under and, and see from the root up, when I say that, I don't expect them to be able to do that. It's not a matter of choice. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of whether that gets manifested or not. And it may manifest over time. Mm -hmm. If a person is very serious and very sincere, it will manifest over time. Right. 
or they may get it right off the bat. But it's not some button that they press in their head to understand. No, absolutely not. And in most cases, it does take place. It does take time. It's not like, you know, an audience of 300 people can sit and listen to some teacher and they all get it. Uh, you know, they might get an inkling of it. They might get a feeling for it. But the, the full ripening of the experience which is being discussed is likely to take quite some time before it's really, it really happens. Yeah, that seems to be the way it works. Yeah. And, you know, and there, there does seem to be a bit of a tendency these days, at least in some circles, for, for teachers to just say, you know, call off the search, realize you're that, and then people walk away from that lecture saying, okay, I've called off the search, I am that, I must be done, I must be enlightened, you know, I'm, <laughs> it's all over with. And, you know, that, that definitely kind of um, rubs me the wrong way. I, I think they're just kidding themselves. Yeah. Rick, that's an interesting point you bring up. Um, a, a, a certain portion of the people do say that, especially the, especially the, um, or the advanced people talk that way. Yep. Now, the, the, the funny thing about it is, what they're saying is it's actually true, but it doesn't work. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, very good point. I mean, it, it's a funny thing. That, and there's this sort of paradox that often comes in where, you know, a person can say something which is perfectly true on its own level, but, you know, is it really being lived, you know? And does it really apply to all levels? You know, like, like for instance, some will say, well, there really is no doer. You know, no, there's nobody who's actually doing anything. And then they'll conclude from that that you shouldn't do spiritual practices or you shouldn't do this or shouldn't do that because it would only imply the existence of a doer. But to me, that's a confusion of levels. Exactly. Um, oh, there, my difficulty is my memory is not great. I, I already forgot. <laughs> I was say in response to you, but I like what you said there. It'll um, come back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I would, let me just uh, feel free to interrupt me if you remember what you were going to say, and I'll just tr hopefully jog your memory. Um, I, personally, I you know, would, you, know you, you guys can do whatever you want, but I would recommend that you just kind of um, have a more nuanced approach to this thing of teachers, because there are a lot of teachers out there who may charge money. Uh, you know, like if you go to a retreat with Adyashanti or something, it's not going to be free. Um, they're going to rent a retreat facility and, you know, and he has a, a staff of 20 people or whatever that, that, are, that need to be supported and so on. Uh, but I don't think that's necessarily an evil. You know, it's, it's different. There are different stru organizational structures. Um, even like, you know, when Ramana Maharshi was living in his little ashram in, in South India, and almost ev I mentioned him because almost everybody agrees that he was a, the real deal. Um, you know, he may not have charged money, but that money must have been donated to build buildings and buy food and so on and so forth. So render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. You know, this it's just a sort of a necessity. Now, you know, in the same breath, I could say that there are people who completely abused that area and gotten totally carried away with money and charged exorbitant prices for, for stuff which should almost really be given away. Um, so there's legitimacy to, to some of the criticisms I've heard you speak about that yeah well I think I think charging and I like the idea of the organization because mo most gurus uh, develop an organization whether they do it by themselves or not mm -hmm. an organization gradually forms around them mm -hmm. and it often takes over um, but the guru ha always has the the freedom to intervene, to ha to create an intervention when when uh, when he becomes aware of uh, a biased charging. For example, Krishna Murti used to have huge big gatherings, but the but it was merely a token, a mission. It was very small all the time. Yeah. And uh, but then there's uh, we can go to another lad, Adi Da. <laughs> He was uh, he was uh, a, an expert capitalist. You know, he really knew how to charge. Oh yeah. How to control that. So you've got those two extremes. Yeah, and perhaps gradations somewhere in between the two. Um, 
I uh, when I interviewed Trip Overhill a, couple, a few weeks ago, we talked about Adi Da a bit, and I, I happened to have had a conversation with a guy who was with him for 17 years, and um, you know the stuff he was into was just horrendous. I mean, some of the some of the things he did, and and you know people would all write it off as crazy wisdom and so on. Um, but ironically, I you know I have interviewed two people, and and I consider both of them friends. One of them is here in my town who were with Adida for a long time and they came out okay you know it's like they're beautiful people they really seem to have a high level of realization a great deal of integrity um, they both walked away from that whole thing but somehow or other you know there's that saying even a broken clock can t tells the correct time twice a day somehow or other they they came out of that experience with a lot of spiritual maturity so go figure yeah well we I don't know how, what your your thinking is, but um, in studying Adi Dada, I I would say this: his teaching was fantastic. Mm -hmm. The ultimate it was ultimate teaching. However, when he got to the Adi Dada stuff, that was nuts. When he started changing his name every other year to some fancier. No, no I don't mean that. I mean Adi Dama was when you had to worship him. Yeah, yeah. Devote you know, that enlightenment could only happen through seeing him, hearing him, feeling him, tasting him, smelling him the whole bit. Right. And you have to turn your whole attention to him. First of all, that that teaching method he was talking about, a form of devotion, complete devotion, was impossible to do. Mm -hmm. It's not neurologically, uh, the brain doesn't allow you can, to do that, that kind of work. So it was, it was, he was asking you to do something that was impossible, but you got hooked by trying. Hmm. Well, this brings up a couple of interesting points. And Troy, uh, uh, you just feel free to chime in anytime you want. Um, you know, don't don't let me override you if you feel like talking about something. Um, I was just going to add to that that uh, when I first met the sign poster, I was exposed to Adi Da. Mm -hmm. In the normal kind of way people are, where they say, "Oh, Adi Da was bad." The behaviors he did, all that sort of thing, and if you're an outsider and that's all you hear about Adi Da, unless you're really open to inquiry to finding out, mm -hmm. most people will just stop there, right? And they totally miss out on a beautiful opportunity to study his the parts of his teaching that are very valuable. For example, I found Adi Da to be one of the most valuable signposters of all signposters not the devotional stuff but his the other parts his writings and stuff yeah I, I had to learn to, to be open to that signposter invited me to do that mm -hmm. originally I was a bit closed I thought oh he's weird or whatever yeah, yeah. and you could you could you <laughs> the funny thing Rick is that um, you can and this is what Adi Da did he he was clever as hell uh, and um he, he managed to reinterpret the so-called cultural, social bad things he was doing. He reinterpreted it as God doing it. Right. And if you can do that and convince people to believe that, then you're all right. Yeah. It only looks bad as long as you're stuck in the cultural, social viewpoint. Yeah. Well, this brings up a couple of really interesting points. Um, you know, I think one of the points is that it's quite common for people to have an awakening which seems which strikes them as being so profound and so complete that they feel like this is it i'm enlightened I'm, it's the, my my path is finished and yet there's still like major stuff in terms of ego and uh, however we want to define it that hasn't been worked out but to which they're completely oblivious and so they they embark on the role of teacher or guru and at a certain point, this this stuff, which hasn't been really dealt with, begins to surface, and the whole thing begins to go off the rails. Um, and I think it's happened in many, many circumstances. Some teachers have had the honesty to come forward and say, hey, wait a minute, I was mistaken. I wasn't enlightened after all. I'm, I'm going to renounce my teachership role and get back to work on myself. Others just carry on and, and you know, go sailing off into la-la land with people following them. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, that's a very, very important observation you've made, because uh, 
there's a lot of these teachers, and, and we could even mention them, but I, like I won't mention them, but there's a lot of modern day teachers that are really well recognized mm -hmm. who know nothing about their inner psychology. Hmm. And that's where they blunder. They do a lot of blundering there. They, th what, what I call them is slogan providers. They hmm. provide a lot of so-called spiritual slogans but they have very little understanding about the ego problems, about emotional problems, about identification problems, about goal orientation problems. And most of all, they don't grasp how the person's been conditioned or programmed from childhood on. They think you can get rid of that with slogans. You can't. Now, how do you know this? And just by observing and by intuitively sort of picking up on it? Yes, yes. Okay, well, let's take a let's take a well-known example. Let's name him by name, Eckhart Tolle. Uh, you know, I don't know if you, if you were alluding to him, um, but I wasn't thinking of him, no. Okay, good. Uh, now he's an example of somebody that you know he charges money. He's probably a wealthy man. He sold millions of books, um, but he seems to be offering a, a valuable teaching. How many people are actually, you know, awakening or becoming enlightened or so on as a result of that? I don't know. But it's it certainly kind of opened a lot of people's eyes to a great extent. And so far, he hasn't gotten weird on us. You know, he's still offering uh, useful stuff, much of it free. Um, so you weren't you weren't alluding to him. But there's an example of somebody who actually awoke quite spontaneously. He he had he hadn't really shown an interest in this kind of thing. And if you've ever heard his story, one day he just kind of woke up. He was getting suicidal, and and in desperation he. He sort of asked, well, you know, I can't, I cannot live with myself anymore. And then he thought, wait a minute, if, are there two of me? Who is this self with whom I can't live? And the next morning he woke up with this profound awakening, which he eventually matured into. Um, I don't know why I'm going on about him, but I just want, I'm just trying to make the point that, again, we have to be careful not to paint with too broad a brush because there are a lot of good, genuine teachers who are making a contribution out there. Yeah, do you like him? I do. I like listening to him. Uh huh. I've read you, most of his books. I'd like to interview him one of these days. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of his books. I don't mean The Power of Now, but there was another one that came out. Uh, New Heaven, New Earth. Something like that, yes. Yeah. yeah. Certain things he said about uh, the way the parents should react to the child was completely psychologically nuts. Hmm. Pardon? Pain body. The pain body. The pain body. I, yeah. It was really, really weird stuff. And people really, they'll buy into anything. Anything that a guru that's been recognized says, they'll buy into it and they'll begin to look for the pain body. Like, like the Freudian situation, you know, looking for the id, looking for the ego, looking for the superego. Though so it's, it's, it's um, concrete things in the body. It gets all distorted. And I, I have to say that, um, personally speaking, uh, I uh, all my intuitive antennas going up uh, and saying, this guy is not it. Well, I guess it depends what we mean by it. Uh, and, and also, you know, when I hear, when I read somebody like Eckhart Tolle, I'm not looking for absolute truth. In fact, I don't look for that in anybody. Um, it's like... Everything is a, is a point or everything is a theory, if we want to speak in scientific terms. Maybe there's a pain body, maybe there's not. It's an interesting idea to play with. Uh, it's a model, perhaps, for the way we're structured. But I don't, I don't think, oh boy, that's the way it is, pain body. I'm a believer. It's like I think, okay, interesting perspective. Now let me hear another one. And when you say that's a lot of bunk and it's a crazy idea, I think, okay, maybe it's a crazy idea. That's the signposters take on it. But I'm not going to believe that with any absolute certainty either. It's to me. It's a, another perspective, another theory on a theory. Yeah, um, uh, it's not so much the pain body itself idea, although I don't buy it. But it's how he applied it to how he was suggesting that it should be applied to children. That, hmm. that and I can't quote you what that is right now. But if yeah, you read, I don't even I don't remember it myself. Huh? Psychologically, it was completely wacky. Okay, well, let me ask you this. Is there a, a teacher out there, besides yourself, I suppose, um, who you, whom you feel, uh, a living teacher, 
whom you feel is has really got their act together, who's who's really teaching in a way that you would sort of endorse or approve of. Hmm. I can't think of any. Okay. How about deceased teachers? Um, lots of them. Nizargada, mm -hmm. Ramana, mm -hmm. uh, UG, UG Krishnamurti, mm -hmm. uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti, mm -hmm. Adi Da. Adi Da, really? Oh, oh, definitely. Despite everything we've said about him, you think he he had the whole package? Uh, yes, he did. Hmm. So even though he was screwing his disciples and addicted to uh, a variety of drugs and watching porn and doing all the things he did, that's cool with you? It's not that it's cool with me if he's if people are being hurt. People were being hurt. Okay, so that, so I say that's that's too bad that they were being hurt. Uh -huh. I wish someone had dragged them away. Yeah, but that doesn't suggest that Adidas teaching was was. Uh, how would I put it, was false. His teaching, you, in a way you've got to distinguish between the teaching as a signpost and the teacher. Almost all teachers have flaws. Mm -hmm. I would say they all have flaws. But the, their teaching can be right smack on. And that distinction has to be really made. Well, if you want to go and learn mathematics from somebody, um, you would expect him not to just be sort of good at reading from a textbook. You would actually expect him to be able to do the mathematics himself, to actually be an embodiment of the knowledge that he professes to teach. So with regard to spiritual knowledge, how effective is somebody's teaching if their life doesn't reflect that teaching? If their life isn't complete, you know, off base with what they're actually saying. Shouldn't you be able to walk your talk if it's a genuine teaching? Yeah, but what would, what would walking your talk be like? What would you expect from Marty Darje to the, the play here? What would you expect him to be like? I would expect that awakening or in, in realization or enlightenment is more than just realizing the absolute nature of the self or some such thing. That that's a that's a first step. That, but the Talking about what would you expect Adi Da would look like? Yeah, uh, and I, I guess my answer to that, or my response to that, would be: Well, what is the utility of a spiritual teaching? What is what what is it for? Is it just to sort of have nice philosophical ideas, or is, does it actually have some practical value in the nitty gritty of life? Well, within the teaching, you must be willing and able to deconstruct what the person is already. What, what the what the what the inquirer already is inquiring about and what the inquirer believes and assumes and concludes that has to be destroyed utterly through deconstruction processes which inquiry are you talking about like someone like myself asking about Adida or what well I wasn't thinking of you but I'm talking about a seeker and an inquirer to a guru okay uh, so let's say somebody comes to Adida as a case in point and and Adida was an expert at deconstructing he could mm -hmm. blow them apart. Mm -hmm. He wasn't too gentle about it. So uh, that, that's what I'm talking about. He, he taught the verbal, the conceptual teaching, but at the same time he blew up the verbal and conceptual teaching that the person was embodied with. In other words, the, 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 the obstructions that the person came to Adida with, the belief systems, the, uh, the assumptions, the presuppositions, the conclusions, all that sort of thing, the premises. You see, everybody comes to another person, we come automatically and unconsciously with all that stuff. And that's what's in the role. Mm -hmm. In other words, we get a notion what reality and truth is, and we come to a teacher with that. That has to be destroyed. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a valuable point. Uh, and, we, and we can talk more about that. But, if, but if, if, if an innocent young girl comes to a teacher expecting yeah. spiritual instruction and ends and up more or less more getting raped, um, uh, you know, it, then maybe, maybe he's blowing, blowing some conceptions yeah. that she was hanging on to, but I don't consider that a very skillful means of doing so or, 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 or you know, kind of a very compassionate way of doing so.
No, he Adi Dove. We have to admit, didn't seem to have the uh, the, uh, the the compassion that was required of great teachers. Mm -hmm. But the question is, how many uh, how many of them do? Some of them Some, do. I, 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 again, yeah, you can't you can't yeah, dismiss yeah. them all in in one fell swoop. No, uh, I said. How many of them do it? Might be a very, very small number. For it, all might, it, it, might, it, it might even be a minority. Okay, so let's let's try to uh, distill a kind of a main point from what we've been talking about for the last ten or fifteen minutes. Uh, maybe some kind of if, see if we could agree upon what constitutes a um, a legitimate teacher, a teacher whom one could respect, whom you could respect, whom I could respect, whom who we would encourage our our granddaughter or daughter to go to for instruction if they were still alive um, without you know fear of, of damage what what sort of uh, criterion criteria would you insist upon if you were going to send someone who is very dear to you to a spiritual teacher I would think I would I would um, pick out a really top-notch well-known Zen master mm -hmm. other than that I, I'm not sure Okay, um, and there have been, of course, instances where top-notch, well-known Zen masters have been found sleeping with their students and so on. But, but you would hopefully find one who had his act together ethically, or would that not matter so much? Would it be more a matter of just the ability to practice and 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 teach Zen? Because of my awareness of the psychological damage that we can that could be done, mm -hmm. I would send my my. Uh, relative or what do you call it, godchild to to one that had his ethics and morality under control mm -hmm. good and i would agree with you which is why i have a hard time accepting that adi da would be you know one of the teachers you felt were really legitimate um you know he definitely had had something to offer he, he packed a punch but you know boy there were there were really some screws loose but we don't want to spend the whole interview talking about adi da just one last thing. Who's the bald headed guy? Isn't it? Wilbur. Wilbur. Ken Wilbur. Uh, he said about Audie Daw at one stage that he wouldn't send just a person that wasn't really, really, really deeply serious for enlightenment uh, to Audie Daw, but if they were really after enlightenment, he'd send them to Audie Daw. Hmm. Yeah. That's an interesting quotation. Yeah, it is. Um, I still wouldn't send my daughter if I had one to see Adi Da, nope. but what the heck? It's just one more ingredient in the stew, you know. That's that's what Ken Wilber says. <laughs> yes, it is. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Rick, it, it, it also we can't just dismiss it either. There's there's something I just want to emphasize that it's not Adi Da that's doing it. We've got to remember that. Oh yeah. Well, that was his alibi. Hey, it's, it ain't me doing it. I'm just uh, I'm a witness. I, you know, it's it's God I mean, doing it. It's whatever. It's God manifesting through me. Right. So you see, what what I'm trying to point out is, God does not have any morality, right or wrong, good or bad, up or down, etc. It's us. It's we freaky little humans that keep pouring that in through religion. Now I'm not. I, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that throwing out all morality and do what the hell you want. I'm not talking that way. I'm just trying to point out, though, that one has to realize that actually it's the Tao that's manifesting. What we might call good or bad, the Tao is doing it. Sure. And that's true of everything. It was the Tao as Hitler. It was the Tao as that guy who shot up the movie theater in Colorado a couple of weeks ago. Exactly. Uh, it's yeah. easy as it seems, as wacky as it seems, and it makes our... We, it certainly should make us think, is our notion about what God is or the Tao is, is it kind of weird? <laughs> you know, we keep humanizing God all the time. Yeah, hey, it's a big universe. Probably there are planets which get hit by asteroids and, you know, billions of people die in an instant. And, and it happens, it probably happens every other day in this b big, vast universe. And so, you know, God is a genocidal maniac if we want to look at it that way. But obviously, when you, when you, when you step out to that perspective, you really can't put a, a moralistic value judgment on it. Yeah, but you can go one step further and say, at the root, there is no such thing as Rick. Right. 
So when the planet planet blows up, no, uh, essentially nobody dies. Nothing's happened. Right. Exactly. Yeah. This is a favorite theme of mine, actually. This, but but w the way I like to play with it is there are mo there are different levels which are simultaneously true. On one level, nothing has happened. On another level, things are happening and they're all perfect. On another level, you know, things aren't perfect and they really need fixing. And all all three of those things are simultaneously true. Uh, and perhaps the nothing's happened level is more true than the other two, but you can't kind of dismiss uh, any one of them. It's like the whole spectrum is what, what we call life. Yeah, as long as we're hooked on pleasure and want to avoid pain, then that's true. Yep. <laughs> um, okay. So let's see. Where were we? So let's... Um, Let's talk a little bit about. Can we? Can we? T I want to talk about your book a bit and what dialogical inquiry is. And there's some interesting little points that I picked up on uh, in the table of contents. Um, but would you be amenable to talking about your own life a little bit? Um, you know, I mean, on what basis? On what authority, uh, based upon your own experience and understanding, have you written this book? And are you saying the things you're saying today? How? How did you get from? being a zitty little teenager like the rest of us to a, a man espousing wisdom and writing books and calling yourself the signposter. What, what was your spiritual path? My spiritual path, and I recommend it highly, is <laughs> 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 to suffer. Uh -huh. To suffer with all your heart and soul. So much so that you begin to inquire deeply almost simultaneously. And that happened when I was very, very young, mm. and it continued to happen over the years. In other words, to put it very bluntly, I will admit it to you, Rick, my dear father figure. <laughs> you know, you're like a priest, eh? I am. I'm, I'm playing the game of priest here. Oh, okay, I see. I, I, yes. I, I will admit mm -hmm. that I was really screwed up. Mm -hmm. I, and it started very young with crazy parents. Ditto. Alcoholic father, mother in a mental hospital, me into drugs. I, I, I went that whole route. Okay. Well, we're brothers in, in truth here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I agree. Uh, suffering like that can be a real impetus to seeking, you know, to try to find your way out of suffering. If everything were just all smooth and easy, there might not be much, much impetus. Yeah. Uh, one little point I'll share. At about four or five, my parents did some horrible things to me, emotionally, psychologically. They abandoned me uh, right in front of my face. Go L on, don't L love you anymore. Literally. Yeah, literally. Uh -huh. Anyway, the point was, I looked to my parents because I thought, as most children, if not all, that they know the answer. They've mm. got the answers. These people really know. Sure. And then. It was, it was about five years old, I began to say, well, they don't seem to know as much as I think they know, <laughs> as they seem to be contradicting themselves. They're saying one thing and so on, and they're also suffering. Mm -hmm. So I had a great realization that adults really don't know, even <laughs> they pretend they do. That was one of the great realizations, and that started in seeking for maybe somebody that does know. Mm -hmm. I went through a similar thing myself, and, and I would actually move from one to the next. I think, okay, this person really knows. And then after a while, I think, no, no, he doesn't. And then I go on to another one, you know. <laughs> right. that, that's good thinking. <laughs> Getting stuck in a rut. Yeah. And so uh, how did it go, progressing from five up through, your, you know, into your teenage years and so on? Did you eventually find a teacher whom you, you know, respected? Uh, only, only in my reading and video observing. Mm -hmm. I I um, I um, I guess I'd have to say that I really didn't have a personal relationship with a te with any teacher. Uh huh. But you read a bunch of teachers and you read a bunch of things and did you yeah. did you end up engaging in some sort of spiritual practice? Yeah, I did some. I I went to. A, Philip Kaplow's uh, monastery in Rochester, New York, I think it was. I actually applied to that in 1968, and they told me I had to study with a local Roshi for a while before going there. And 
uh, I ended up going off on a different path. But I know how, it's funny. Small world. Right, it is. <laughs> and I, I went there for a while and uh, did a lot of meditating. Mm -hmm. And then, I don't know, this sounds, this sounds uh, blasphemous, blasphemous, but um, I came to the conclusion that meditation really isn't going to get you anywhere. It's not a way to get. Mm -hmm. Meditation is something you might do to celebrate or to just exist. Meditation is a nice way to exist. Uh, so, so it's sort of like the, the um, what was his name, that guy that threw it out as quietism? Hui Nang. Hui Nang. I, I like the attitude of Hui Nang towards meditation. Which was? Which was that he, 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 he thought he th thought meditation was just a form of quietism. Mm -hmm. And he said, quietism doesn't do anything. And threw it out. Uh, and that's how the uh, Zen Kuan came into existence. Hmm. But he did bring it in. No, he was a very free Zen master. He's one of the most um, powerful, dynamic human beings I think uh, ever walked the planet. Hmm. He was a revolutionary. I would suggest with regard to meditation that there are many different forms of it, just like there are many different things that we refer to as liquids, but they're not all going to have the same effect if you drink them. And, uh, you know, some, some form of meditation might be very uh, stress-producing rather than stress-releasing. Um, but, you know, to each his own. I mean, a lot of people, uh, you know, swear by it and have gotten tremendous benefit from it and feel like it's led to their liberation or the realization. Others feel like, well, you know, it was a waste of time. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, do you know John DeRoyter? I've heard of him. He's up in Canada, Edmonton or someplace. So. Yeah, Edmonton. Yeah, I have a next-door neighbor who used to drive up there practically every weekend to see him. Amazing. Uh, anyway... John doesn't uh, mention meditation at all, mm -hmm. just as an example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a big world. And, uh, you know, some people, meditation is their focus. Other people, they, you know, selfless service. And, all, you know, other people, I don't know, all sorts of different spiritual practices and approaches. So people tend to gravitate toward the thing which does it for them. Yeah. And, and the, the important point is what you bring your what you bring to meditation. That's that, the yeah, I, I agree. You know, if you if you have a lackadaisical attitude, then maybe it's not going to do much for you. Or you bring, if you bring forth, if you bring to meditation uh, uh, um, an attitude of efforting, mm -hmm. that's useless. I agree. Not that my agreement in any way validates the point, but that's my understanding as well. Uh huh. Um, so anyway, so you you did a lot of meditation. You eventually decided it was just sort of a, a form of quietude that wasn't going to get you anywhere. And so then what? Well, I just dropped it. A and but, but but periodically I will meditate. Okay. But not, but not as a not as a rule or not as a system. Right. Um, and so you know you're still talking about something that happens. 60 years ago or 55 years ago as a relatively young man. So what has been happening all of your life? I mean, now you're, you're, you know, you're a signposter. You're someone who is, who is teaching other people and so on. Um, what, uh, how, give, sp spell it out for us a little bit more. You know, what it, was there like an awakening at some point or has it been just a very gradual incremental growth of wisdom as, as you've aged or what? That's like, that's an interesting question it, it, because two things happened. I had very, very powerful, uh, at least four or five, well, I would say five mystical experiences of, mm -hmm. you know, of some very supreme mystical experience of unusual. And, but what's really interesting about that is that wasn't the important point. What was the important point was the gradual underlying unconscious awakening that was going on mm. and that took place over the whole life that. yeah that's a good point in fact I was going to ask you would, would it be worth talking about these mystical experiences but you know the second thing you said I think is very significant um, because obviously mystical experiences can come and go right yeah so, something which can come can also go yeah. <laughs> exactly but what what's interesting Rick 
a mystical experience at at, at least does one one major thing it allows you the inquirer the seeker to realize that there's a capacity in our being that's way beyond the ordinary yeah it's so unusual that it it, it it awakens you to the fact that you have infinite potential yeah and if because ordinarily you would never have any experience like that no i totally agree i mean in, in my case the first time i had a, a mystical experience was on lsd back in the 60s and i thought holy crap uh, i'd always assumed the world was just the way i i thought i perceived it to be but but uh, it all depends upon how you perceive it, and that can change radically. So I thought, whoa, well, that's the that's the purpose of life is to radically change the way you see the world to the point where you're really seeing it as it is. Yeah. And of course, LSD didn't do it for me, but um, you know, it was a, it was a kick in the pants to begin with. It's quite a shock to find out that your version of reality is just that. Uh, yeah, version. yeah. And it seems like most people in the world have taken their version of reality for granted. And just assume that you know what the world they see is the world that is. Yeah, and that's conditioning. Mm -hmm. That's cultural, social conditioning. Yeah. And I did hear you talk quite a bit about that in your interview with Trip, and perhaps you discuss it a lot in your book. But so we'll get to that in just a second. But so, you know, so you just said that the, the mystical experiences were significant, and that they they showed you that there was something more than what you were routinely experiencing but that the real significant thing w is that which has kind of grown gradually and subtly over time and it doesn't come and go right yes now I have to explain something mm -hmm. in order for that to happen you have to have an attitude that's with you continuously of observation mm -hmm. of observing everything going around you especially people mm -hmm. and checking it out testing it out and that's how you learn Mm -hmm. that people are really locked into what I call cultural social prison. People uh -huh. in prison of a cultural social nature. And I and I kept observing and testing that out through the years. And who or what is the warden of that prison? Their own mind. Their own mind. Yes. Right, or so you can't, you can't blame their parents or society or something. We're saying it's our own mind that does this. Well, it's parents and society that creates their mind. Right, and who created parents and society's mind? It goes back and back and back. Yeah, so it's just a never-ending condi con condition. Pardon? <laughs> turtles all the way down. Yeah, turtles all the way down, right. <laughs> I love that. So, so you're saying there's just a sort of an age-old mm, wheel of conditioning that just keeps rolling. Right. And um, if we want to get off the wheel, then we need to begin to do what exactly? Observe and test. Okay. And specifically, how do you do that? Let's say Troy is a student of yours, and he goes through his day. Um, what do you do all day, Troy, observing and testing? Uh, well, one example was uh, when I was an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. there certain, you have all kinds of professors, right? Mm hmm and uh, through the book, through reading the book, certain sections of the book uh, allowed me to not get caught up in seeing the professor as the basically authority of n knowing it all or having all the answers. Which book are you talking about? The sign posters book or? Yeah. Oh, it's okay. Like, yeah. And through my dialogues with them. So I would observe carefully. Uh, different professors or different people and one of the things I learned was that people are um, incredibly uh, narcissistic mm -hmm. that's just one example okay um, and so let's say you come to that conclusion that people in general are, are incredibly narcissistic what do you do with it how does it help you become less narcissistic or more liberated or whatever it is we're supposed to become I uh, I don't think there's like a method. I think you you keep going. You, you just keep observing. Okay. You don't, don't bring the first insight with you. Like you don't hold on to that. You'll rediscover it again and again, deeper and deeper through observing. Mm -hmm. And there's no way I could say, okay, it's going to go this way or this happens. And it's a process. 
it's an unknown. You don't know where it's going to go. That's what it, inquiry is. Okay. So um, speaking to either of you then, is the is there a sense in what you're doing of um, a kind of an on a progression a progression where there's going to be sort of um, deeper realization or clearer realization or or some such thing as as you continue to inquire and to observe? I would say so. Yeah. Okay. And would you identify any? Um, either significant milestones or ultimate destination in this process or is it something we do till the day we die? Uh, I don't know. I'm, in, I'm inquiring into that. <laughs> How about you, Sign Poster? Um, enlightenment is a process. It's not a state. Okay. And therefore, it, it can go on eternally. Mm -hmm. Just like God is eternal and and in an God is an eternal mystery, so enlightenment can go on eternally. And so when you say that, um, can you define enlightenment a little bit better? Let's, let's see if we're on the same page with that. Well, I don't tend to define anything because that only limits it. Okay. But if we're going to use a word, then that, that word is referring to something, and we, and we want to make sure we have a common understanding about what that word represents. Otherwise, we're not communicating. I, I understand that, and and it's a difficult difficulty. The only thing I can perhaps do is answer questions. Okay. So then my question is, let's say, okay, let's say there's some traditionally enlightened people that we might think of, the Buddha or Ramana Maharshi or Nisargadatta or these people. Um, you say it's not a state. It's, a, it's, I think you said, a process that continues. Yeah. So these guys, you would say, were not in some state per se, they were adepts at a process. Would that be correct? Yeah, at, at a certain stage of the process. An advanced stage. Yeah. Which is why we respect them as uh, teachers. Advanced relative to the rest of the world. <laughs> right. The population. But theoretically not any kind of final destination, something which could continue on and on for all we know. Yeah. The danger is, with even with these people that we revere, a great deal. The danger is with Jesus and Buddha and Ramana and whoever else, the danger is that we we project onto them ultimate enlightenment when it could have when it could be a heavy dose of ego inflation. Could be. Um, although, you know, I guess that that'll offer that begs the question of is there any example of ultimate enlightenment throughout history or are you saying we should just always take it every, everything with a grain of salt and not just assume you know there there could be an alternate explanation of what made these guys special yeah I, I would say not to join the crowd mm -hmm. uh, did you ever meet Ramana oh no he when did he die 1956 or something like that right I, I would have been like six years old then <laughs> I, I'm only asking the question to point out that oh. you have no first hand knowledge of him at all no, in fact, I don't even have, I haven't even read his books in any detail yet. I just kind of, everybody talks about him, so I talk about him. But I, I'd like to read his books, but he sounds... Example of what I'm talking about. Yeah. We, we, we join the crowd, and that's a mistake. Right. Uh, your American statement, I'm from Missouri, mm -hmm. you know, says, I will test him out when I see him. Yeah, it's the show me state, Missouri. Right. And until that happens, keep an open mind. Yeah, I think that's a great attitude. And you can, you, you can, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Ramana may not have been the enlightened guy that it's been projected onto him. A guy that sits on a bed a great deal at a time and wobbles around, you know, with a, with a limp leg, and he sits in what looks like a pampered diaper, uh, that doesn't tell me he's enlightened. And he reads comic books. That doesn't necessarily mean he's enlightened. Did he read comic books? Yeah. Oh, okay. But that's fine. I think that's great. Yeah, and it doesn't tell you he's not enlightened that's, either. You, you see what I'm getting at, though? You, you, could, you, could, you see, it's, they, they make such a big deal out of a guy that lies in bed all day. <laughs> <laughs> not a bad gig. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I guess what you're saying is we should be suspicious of any external criteria 
for enlightenment and uh, you know enlightenment could be there in someone who whom we would least expect exactly, exactly. right and doesn't the, have to speak with an Indian accent or wear a loincloth or anything exactly yeah, of course I, I'm, I'm really very wary of the mob rules in spiritual matters mm -hmm. it can be very ridiculous like Nidra he smoked himself to death what the hell right. is wrong with him yeah <laughs> <laughs> And yet, you know, uh, when you read his books, just like you read Adi Da's books, the guy was brilliant, you know? Yeah, now there you got it. Yeah. Uh, Krishnamurti, uh, you see, the strange thing about Krishnamurti is because he talks so simple and he, talk, and he writes books that are so easy to read, people think he's not saying anything. But if you really study what he's saying, he says things just as profound as Adi Da. But you've got to go deep to really examine what he's saying. Are you talking about UG or the or J? Yeah, Jiddu. Oh, J. Okay, yeah. Now UG was really something else. Oh, he was a, he, he was a trip. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was, you know, on the face of it, you'd say he's nuts, but but at the same time, there was one theme that you have to remember with with UG. He was telling you all knowledge, all thought is off. It's not it. And that's what he did all his life in a crazy manner. He was, a, he was almost like an actor that's completely destroying everything. But what he was, that was his main theme. All knowledge and all thought is not. <laughs> well, you know, actually, I listened to a talk that uh, Troy gave, I think, on YouTube. And um, I thought you did a pretty good job of it in terms of explaining how we really don't know anything because we're capable of knowing only a tiny fraction of what's actually going on. You know, our eyes can only see so much of the electromagnetic spectrum, and our ears can only hear so much, and so on and so forth, right? That, that was you, wasn't it? Um, so it seems to be what, you know, what the sign poster is saying here. But when I listened to that, I thought, yeah, but, uh, you know, enlightenment or realization is not about, you know, something you see through the senses, because obviously the senses have their limitations. We're just a tiny little speck in a vast universe. It's about awakening to that which is beyond the senses, which is which is in its in its nature universal. We are uh, a term we will use as the only, mm -hmm. and that just signifies basically that the senses are the only as well, or you could call it God, or like enlightenment. I don't know if we're necessarily saying we know what enlightenment is. Like, I don't really know what that is because that would mean I could know what life is or God, you know. Uh, we're saying there's just the only, and the only is a great mystery. And everything that is there, including senses, is the great mystery or the only as well. It's not that um, they are, some people call it transcendent and imminent, meaning it, it goes beyond the senses, like you mentioned. But it's imminent. It's in the. It's, it's non-dual. It's the the mm -hmm. only. But we don't. We're not saying we know what that is. Like I'm not saying I know that. Uh huh. You just have a you have a intellectual it, facility with it or film familiarity with the, the it, idea. It, what when you talk about like a process um, can basically be summarized as deconstructing, like UG knowledge which is the cultural social enterprise deconstruction deconstruction and then there's also a quote knowing more and more that you don't know what anything is and that's the ultimate it all goes there eventually mm -hmm. uh, Adi Da called it uh, divine ignorance Christian already had his word for it Zen master that's what they're pointing to UG Nisargadatta it, that's where it all goes like that's the All roads point there. So it's, it's kind of a, an interesting point. The question comes up, can you be happy in nothing? And yes, you can. When you get to the point that you don't know what anything is, then it's a, there's a great possibility you can be happy in that. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be despairing and commit suicide. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, here's another guru for you that, that's quite effective in helping people to do that, uh, Byron Katie. Uh, she, she has this system which is quite effective in, in prying loose people's certainty about what they think. You know, are you, you know, they're, they're sure of something and said, do you, do you really know that for sure? Do you absolutely know that to be true, you know? And then look at it from the opposite perspective. And she's, she's really good with this system of helping people to get to a state of not knowing. Yeah, that's, it's, she does have a very good system. Very yeah. nice. It's, she's, she's a good, very good deconstructor. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about your book a little bit. I, um, I read through the whole table of contents. And what is the title of the book, by the way? The Delusion of Being Human. Okay, that's a good one. You want to elaborate on that a bit before we dig into it? Well, I'm going to let Troy's not do much talking, so I'm going to invite him to take over. Okay. Uh, well, I think it just means uh, that basically the ultimate goal of the book is to point out your true nature like to remove the obstructions and encumbrances that lay in the road of that mm -hmm. and one mm -hmm. of the major ones is your neurological system culture society gives you the feeling like the, your basic sense of consciousness is a limitation a point of view being human and that has to be transcended I think that's just it that's the main thing of that title. Good. I like that. Uh, <clears throat> because, you know, we are obviously, I mean, the, to my understanding, that's what the whole enlightenment game is all about, is the realization that you really are something which is far beyond just the human, you know, biological mechanism. Um, yeah. So, um, Rick, yes. Should I, should I just intervene for one moment? Uh -huh. uh, what I'm finding that would be worthwhile making some comment about is that this new thing called uh, evolutionary enlightenment mm -hmm. and uh, um, integral psychology, integral philosophy and spirituality, etc., mm -hmm. is is that is fundamentally inviting people to join one another in love while being in the dream. That's all I wanted to say about it. Okay. It's well, nearly trying to make a dream better. Well, I just interviewed Andrew Cohen a couple of weeks ago, and um, I can't speak on his behalf. He's, he's the this founder or the proponent of this evolutionary enlightenment. And I, I think what he would say is he, he would probably agree with you in a sense. Like, sure, we can, uh, if we wish, we could say that the whole world is a dream. I mean, Shankara said the world is an illusion. Brahman alone is real. The world is Brahman. Um, and so, yeah, but what's wrong with making the dream better? Um, it's a nightmare, maybe. Pardon? It's better than a nightmare. It certainly is. And what? Ha and what? It, where is there to go after the absolute is realized? Well, it, you know, we're still living, breathing entities, and I think the, you know, the where to go at that point is in start infusing that into the relative more. You know, become more aligned or attuned with that with with that level of, of cosmic intelligence because it's going to mean that the individual expression of your life is much more enjoyable both for yourself and for those whom it influences. Yes, all I'm saying is it would be nice if they tell people that you're just joining us in a dream. Some of them do. You know, so there's this guy that I've interviewed a couple of years ago named Timothy Conway, and he, he's written this really nice article um, where he talks about just what we were saying, how, sure, this world is a dream world and we're just dream characters, but uh, just because it is doesn't mean that we, dis we don't, you know, want to behave more intelligently and responsibly. I mean, you know, Troy's going off to college to get a Ph.D., uh, why do that if it's only a dream? Well, because he'll be more effective in the world. He'll live a better life in, in this dream world, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I guess the point I'm making is that it doesn't, um, realizing what you just said doesn't mean we just blow the whole thing off and, and sit around on the street corner. We can still engage creatively and responsibly and constructively in this dream world. Yeah, I, I'm just saying it would be really responsible, wonderfully responsible if uh, people who joined that, that organization 
uh, were told that you're joining a dream. <laughs> I think it's important to point out uh, because otherwise, I suppose you could begin to take the dream too seriously. And that's, right. that's yeah. exactly what happens. Yeah, there, there's something you refer to in your book quite often. Mister, you say the conversation with Mister begins, and uh, you know later on you say, you know the conversation with Mister continues. Who is this Mister you're referring to? The Mister is a person called Hermit that I met when I was suffering most. Ah. When I was on a farm by myself, I got um, chopped by two women. At the same time, my wife and my visitors chopped me, <laughs> and I went into what they called howling. And I was on a farm, desperate, and I happened to meet this old man, uh, who wasn't as old as he looked, actually, but uh, he had a cabin in the in the forest, and he would meet uh, with ten to fourteen people, and I was eventually invited to that, and that helped to wake me up. And this was up in Canada, someplace. Yeah. Okay. And so he was really, you said you didn't have a teacher, but it sounds like maybe this guy was a, a teacher of sorts for you. Yes, truthfully speaking, he was a teacher, but he wasn't, he, he wasn't well known and he disappeared. Well, that's okay. It was a very strange phenomena, mm -hmm. an unusual phenomena. Interesting. So what kind of impact did he have on your life? Powerful. In what respect? Well, actually, it changed my life. How so? Uh, I saw through the delusion of my suffering. Ha. Huh. So originally, before you met him, your suffering was very real, and oh, I'm going through all this terrible stuff. And then after you had spent some time with him, it's like you realized it was just uh, it wasn't as real as you thought. Uh, well, uh, what what I realized was that that the all the conditioning and programming of the, the culture. I had interjected that into my neurological brain mind system and then I projected it out and that was the suffering. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was I was continuing to project to put it bluntly the bullshit that I inherited from the cultural social enterprise. Mm. And that was that was my suffering. When I when I really got that, that suffering disappeared. Huh. I was able to to free myself from the addiction to my mistress. And you, you're speaking literally of a mistress here. You had a wife and a mistress, so you were addicted to the mistress, and the two of them somehow maybe colluded and just said, to heck with this, and you're out of here, buddy. You mentioned the soulmate? Uh, uh, Troy just told me I might mention the soulmate. After that, I, uh, after that suffering, I met, met, met my soulmate. Um, and that's another story, but I, all I can say is that's when dialogical inquiry really took place for both of us. And it was the first time I didn't put on an act and try to con a woman. Hmm. My soulmate, I never tried to con her. It was the first time I told the truth huh. <laughs> about myself. Interesting. So it was good then that you went through this suffering. It was a necessary kind of purgatory for you to get to the other side of it and, and meet the person you were supposed to meet. It's almost impossible to wake up without suffering. Huh. I, I don't want to say absolutely because there's obvious exceptions. Yeah, just thinking about that. It, it might depend. I, I, I think there would... It obviously varies from one individual to the next, but I, I, perhaps, I don't, and I don't know if I want to give any glib uh, suggestions as to why some suffer so much more than others. Uh, but perhaps if if we look at it from the broadest possible perspective, and if we think of God as being ultimately, you know, on our side, you know, in our, to have our best interests in mind, then He's not just sort of being a, a t uh, sadistic tormentor by putting us through suffering. There's there's actually some sort of lesson to be learned through it. I don't buy that at all. Okay, what would you say? I, God doesn't have any interest in mine. He doesn't have any kind of go purpose or evolutionary uh, goal, so to speak, for the universe? No. Okay, so what he is... God Go just continues to manifest. We put the valuation on it. 
Mm. But doesn't there, and speaking back to, uh, about evolutionary enlightenment, doesn't there seem to be this sort of evolutionary impetus or, or direction? Things keep kind of growing and evolving and progressing and, and so on. Yeah, it seems to be that, that the human species is, is um, improving in some areas, but it's also, uh, at the same time as it's improving in some areas, it's getting more dreadful and more, uh, actually more, um, what's the word uh, in the Bible, more... Destructive? Uh, more destructive, more more apocalyptic. Yeah, no, I agree. There's, we're, you know, the... The more we progress, the, the uh, on the very on the other hand, the more we capable we, we become of destroying the environment and <laughs> destroying the planet. Exactly, but, and God may be playing a game here for all we know because He enjoys it. Just playing a little bit of uh, metaphor here, uh, He may want us to think we're really progressing, and then He's going to pull the plug on the whole thing. Could be, but but don't just talk about us or our planet. Even look at the big picture. I mean, we started out with the Big Bang, I suppose, and we we probably had nothing but subatomic particles, and they eventually congealed into hydrogen, and we eventually formed stars. And within the within the fusion reaction in stars, we began to get heavier elements, and that gave rise to planets, and you know, life formed somehow. And it's like there's been this whole kind of evolution or progression uh, from a, an amorphous nothingness to a very rich, complex, you know, ecosystem and, and world. And, and ours, of course, is only one of billions. Uh, but so there does seem to be this kind of evolutionary progression that has taken place. And that's what I refer to when I, when I speak of God having a, a purpose or a, 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 an evolutionary direction. And of course, the word God is tricky because there's so many connotations with it. But well, I, I would just mean the intelligence that underlies and governs the universe or and, and permeates it yeah i hear what you're saying and, and and it could be that but then again we don't know no it's interesting speculation i suppose it just seems that way to my understanding so anyway so you you met this hermit sorry it's a good story to calm human beings down yeah or to help them gain a little bit of a handle on on the way things actually are maybe i mean if we if we you know I mean, you you're, you say certain things with a fair amount of certainty or a fair amount of conviction, like, you know, okay, this you're expressing your understanding of things. And I, I suppose to any of those things I could say, it's a good story, it's a nice theory, and maybe you'd agree with me, but we still formulate them, you know, we still play with these theories. Yeah, but I like reminding myself that I really don't know. Yeah, absolutely, here, here. I, I totally agree with you. Um, it's, I was, a friend was just telling me today in an email, she was saying, you really have to drop all your concepts, all your baggage, just drop it all. And I'd say, well, you know, I'm not as attached to it as you might think. There's certain things that make a lot of sense to me, but I, I hold them all somewhat lightly. You know, they are theories. And, and, you know, if we think of ourselves as scientists, so to speak, if someone comes along with a better theory or something that shoots holes in our cherished theories, then it's great, you know. We we want to we want truth. We don't want to just cling to to unrealistic notions. So let's shoot them all to pieces. If if you know something can do that. Yeah, we we really don't know when the story is going to end. We or keep if, creating or, the story. Yeah, or if it will. That's right. So and anyway, you 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 went through this suffering bit, and you met the hermit, and then on the other side of that, you met your soulmate, and you were, you were honest for the first time in your life with her. With, with with a woman, I I, yeah. I wasn't trying to con them into being under my control, which you had always done in the past, I suppose. Yes, I always thought I had to yeah. lie and shoot the shit. Yeah, that that has a kind of a short range effect. <laughs> so, you uh, you stayed with this woman all of her life. W which one's that? The soulmate. Uh, I've been with my soulmate uh, twenty one years. Great. And um, I suppose this has been an, an aid in your, in your dialect, dialogical inquiry, your ability to question and, and probe and examine assumptions. Exactly. And another thing that's no small matter, she, she nursed me when I was pretty well through life, when I was dying almost, uh, when I came back from the hospital. She nursed me back to life. Great. Um, 
So your book is a long one, and we can't really go through every little chapter here, um, but just walk us through what you consider to be the most important salient points, if you would, because I presume that this book is your, it's kind of like your life's work, it's your legacy, you know, all the, what that which you understand and, and feel to be useful for people you've put here. Um, so, so give us a glimpse of it, and you know, when it goes on the market, maybe some of the people who listen to this will, will want to buy it. Yeah, I just want to say uh, something about the soulmate situation. Okay. Uh, people think you find your soulmate. It's not something you find. It's something you create. And you create it together when you already have moved from thinking that the cultural social enterprise has any answers for spirituality and transcendence. So the soulmate is one who helps you, first of all, serve God. Mm -hmm. Second, know God. Third, become God. Hmm. And that's through dialogical inquiry and investigation and so on and so forth. But you start out more or less serving God because you don't know what God is. Mm -hmm. And you begin to know God in a sense of knowing God to be the only. And then eventually you realize, well, that includes me. Mm -hmm. So that that's what I mean by soulmate. That, that's why it's called soulmate. Yeah. That's good. And I presume you speak from experience here. You've gone through this progression? Yes, exactly. Okay. And so to jump to the third one, well, f let's jump, let's go to the second one, knowing God. When, when you had kind of arrived at the knowing God stage, what did you know? That only God is. And it's a great mystery. Mm -hmm. And it will always be a great mystery. And that knowledge was not just intellectual, I presume. It was somewhat experiential, intuitive, visceral, kind of... Totally existential. Yeah. You were living it, not just yeah. thinking it. Yeah, and everything that arise, referring to that to, to deconstruct what was arising. Uh-huh. And then the third one, that you are God, of course some people would freak out if they heard you know, anybody say that, but you're not referring to your individual ego being God. You're referring to, you know, you are that totality, right? Yeah. First of all, ego is behavior. It's not something that exists. It's just behavior. Mm -hmm. e ego is the, it, ego takes place when there's an assumption you're a separate self. Yeah. So, when you realize that's all crap, there's no such, it's not possible to be a separate self. You know, when you realize that's totally impossible, then you say, I am the only. Mm -hmm. And again, I always ask this, but um, it's easy. I mean, when I was 18 years old, I could hear ideas like this and say, yeah, yeah, I understand. I got it. But I, I think what you're saying is it's something much more than just having a sort of a, uh, an intellectual kind of affinity with the ideas you're saying here. You're, you're talking about, as you say, something really existential, something deeply experiential, something, you know, uh, at the gut level that, that one is living. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a realization that's, um, that's it's, it's, it's almost infinite, you could call it, an infinite mm -hmm. realization. Yeah. And would you say it's something that's kind of, it's, it's there 24-7, it's not something that comes and goes whenever you happen to remember to think about it, it's just you're kind of an ongoing fun foundation? Well, I'm going to put it in terms of conditioning. Mm -hmm. uh, condition stimulus response. When a, when a cultural social uh, stimulus arises, then that ordinarily will trigger off or elicit a cultural social response. Mm -hmm. Well, what has happened is the cultural social response that's elicited from the stimulus, the cultural social stimulus, now elicits, I am the only. <laughs> I don't understand. Um, <laughs> can you make it more, um, can you give what? me an example? Or, or, or Are you saying this is something that happens to an, an average sort of ignorant person or are you saying this is somehow uh, a more enlightened way of functioning or what? 
Okay, here's a, here's a way of putting it. Okay. Uh, Jordan just said somebody might ask you, how, how, how's the weather today? Mm -hmm. Well, the, 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 the social response, the conditioned social non-thinking response is, it's not a bad day. Well, as soon as that arises, this is not a bad day, that's a social response. Immediately, what kicks in, because it's been conditioned together, is, ah, God has spoken to God. Ah, so you're saying that when when the realization dawns that I am God, then ordinary, simple, everyday interactions like how's the weather and the weather's fine, those are seen as just being God interacting within with Himself. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So every little thing, you know, you're buying carrots in the grocery store, whatever. The carrots are God. The checkout yeah. clerk is God. The, you right. know, it's right. all God. It's it's God playing that. Right. It's God carroting and God checkout clerking and God, you know, paying, moneying and... <laughs> shitting. What was the last one? God bullshitting. Bullshitting, whatever. Yeah. So that gets us back to that perspective that we were talking about, you know, half an hour ago is, you know, if, if we want to see it, if, if God really is omnipresent, as they say, then where, you know, where... Where is he not? You That's know, right. I mean, he's in. He was in Aus He was. He permeated Auschwitz as as thoroughly <laughs> as he permeates, you know, the Grand Canyon or Yosemite National Park or something. Exactly. Yeah. And does this? Uh, and I guess you're saying, does this realization? And I again, I'm I'm assuming that there's some experiential f nature to it for you, not just the. Uh, uh, a good philosophical grasp on it. Does this realization have any practical significance? Uh, for instance, right now you you have two different forms of cancer you mentioned, and you know you may not be long for this world. How has this realization uh, enabled you to deal with that circumstance? Oh, uh, I had these two forms. Oh, they went away. Uh, they got cured through operation. Oh, very good. Yeah. Great. But I, I'm still suffering the effects of the operation. <laughs> <laughs> the operation was hellish. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, but let's say, I mean, there's a real nitty-gritty situation that all of us will face in one form or another one day. Um, how has the, let's say, spiritual maturity that you've gained over the course of a lifetime enabled you to deal with that sort of thing as compared with maybe the guy in the next room in the hospital who hadn't had that sort of development? Well, first of all, there were several times that I was close to death, you know, heart, heart things and bleeding, bleeding to death and so on and so forth. They, they were rushing me around from one emergency situation to the next, et cetera. And I sure didn't like the idea that I was going to die. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, but interesting enough, I went in, oh, by the way, I went into a depression, mm -hmm. a, a clinical depression where I lost all interest in, in anything, everything. And my dear soulmate nursed me out of that. She would get me to get up and walk 10 feet to start off, just walk 10 feet, just get up rather than, and I did it, strangely enough, I did it not for me, but I did it for her. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, all I can say is that it helped me through the, those rough times and uh, I was, I was, um, I was challenged very, very profoundly and deeply with the possibility that there is no afterlife. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that all that's been said about that by religion and so on and so forth is all just metaphor. It's all just talk for an insecure organism. So I was trying to face the nothingness that was, was on its way. And, um, that was a tremendous challenge, really a tremendous challenge. Uh, and so I, I began to experiment. I wanted to see if I could find in, in, in the midst of that 
some form of security. So I tried to go back to an old religion. I tried to create and, and stimulate an old belief system. And that was an interesting experiment. I discovered several things that you cannot create a belief system just because if you're aware of what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You cannot create a belief system for security's sake. Yeah. I also discovered another wonderful thing to, uh, that's not, um, I don't know if I get much agreement on this one, but you cannot surrender. It's impossible to surrender deliberately, consciously. Hmm. It's something that takes place magically. I use the word magically because you can't do it. The self can't do it. The phony hmm. self can't do it. It's something that just takes place. So I dropped that experiment, and uh, here I am. Huh. Yeah. It was, it was Woody Allen, by the way, who said, I don't mind dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. Um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and uh, uh, you make some good points. It's interesting. You know, it's like this point about not being able to conjure up a religion again kind of reminds me of the point that, you know, once the, once the snake has been seen to be only a rope, you don't see it as a snake again. You know, you, you can't go back to seeing it as a snake. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was quite an experiment. Yeah. And this thing about um, not being able to surrender willfully, I, I think that's very profound. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of teachers that just say, oh, just, you know, just give up the search, just realize who you are, yada, yada. And, you know, I, I always want to hear them say that. I think it's not so volitional for people. You know, they can't just snap their fingers and, and have this happen. You can't let go, Rick. Yeah, not, not willfully. That's right. It's something that happens. It's I mean, maybe you can willfully just relax the struggle a little bit, but in terms of complete liberation, completely letting go, I, I think you're right. Yeah. It's a manifestation of the Tao. Mm -hmm. What I would say, though, maybe, see if you agree with this, is that um, you can kind of, you can't just jump off the precipice but you can move yourself towards the precipice to the point where you're there at the edge and then the wind can blow you off or something. Uh, you know what I mean by the metaphor? It's, it's like if a person is deeply conditioned, they're not just going to snap out of all those layers of conditioning, but the, but the conditioning can be worked out, you know, bit by bit to the point where perhaps the last, you know, shred of it will, will, will go. Yeah, uh, Rick, my, my ex I, I don't like to use the word experience, but my, my understanding or my apprehension of this thing called um, conditioning is that there is no guru ever was got free of all conditioning. None of them got free of it. What, the, what happens is that when they notice or observe the conditioning arising, they can let it go then. But they never get free of it. Yeah. And I guess it kind of depends on what we mean by conditioning, because some forms of conditioning are essential to life. I mean, we're conditioned to get hungry, we're conditioned to, you know, breathe, <laughs> and things like yeah. that. That's, that's not conditioning, that's not your biological Oh, nature. yeah, okay, that must be autonomic nervous system stuff. So by conditioning, you mean any also, kind of, also, yeah, also. sure. You're probably true, you're probably right. I mean, even you think of the most enlightened examples we can think of, and they were they were a product of their culture, they were a product of their time, and, um, you know, had certain assumptions and understandings and so on that uh, were ingrained in them and during their upbringing, and I've seen it in a number of cases of people whom I have great respect for, so I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah there, there's impulses that continue, mm -hmm. compulsions, obsessions. Yeah. The only thing is they're not caught in it, you know, for a long period of time. And they may not be caught in it at all. I mean, you know, they speak of the binding influence of action. And, uh, you know, some teachers, I think, would say to what you're saying, 
yeah, you're still going to see the remnants of conditioned behavior on, on the observable level of, of a person's life. But if you actually could step inside their subjective experience, you would find that they're free. They're not actually bound by these, um, you know, types of behavior that you're seeing on the surface. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it just it depends on what, to what degree and what what kinds of conditioning. For example, in, if you wanted to study that, uh, I think his latest book, Belsakar, wrote that no, no guru is free of conditioning. Uh -huh. Just as an example of one person that made that statement. Now it's very hard for gurus to admit that they're still conditioned <laughs> when they've got another game going. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think they're human beings. I mean, Eckhart Tolle likes his morning cup of coffee. He's actually had people come up to him in coffee shops and say, you know, hey, I thought you were enlightened. Why are you why are you buying coffee? He says, I, I like coffee. <laughs> you know. Um, if it, 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 it speak the truth more often. Yeah. If his dog died, he he has a dog. He likes to walk in the woods. I'm sure he'd be upset if his dog died. Yeah. You know, we we're human beings. No matter. Well, uh, we're not human. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We are and we aren't. I mean, the conditioned aspect of us is the unconditioned aspect of us is not right. Yeah. Well, it's only a label. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and that's what I'm getting at is that. Sure, as humans, there's always going to be conditioning. It just goes with the territory. But if enlightenment means anything, I think it means actually, you know, a state of liberation from the binding influence of conditioning, from the binding influence of action. So that action, can, you can be fully engaged in action, but no longer um, doing so... Uh, in a conditioned way, no longer having uh, conditioning shroud your true nature. Yeah, a person can be caught into the process of getting a desired outcome, right? Mm -hmm. But here's the point. What happens often is uh, as you awaken, you are no longer attached to the outcome. Perfect. Yep. There's a great, that reminds me of a verse in the Gita. It says, you have control over action alone, never over its fruits. Be not attached to the fruits of act. Engage yourself in all actions without being attached to the fruits of your action. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's, only, it's a universal probability you may or may not get the fruits. True. Other, it's you, got nothing. You, you see, have you read Gorzybski's book, uh, Sanity? Science and Sanity? Science and Sanity? No. Well, he brought out a fantastic statement, and it's something that you can meditate on continuously uh -huh. all day long and test it out all day long. It's called the map is not the territory. That's good. I like that phrase. Yeah, it's a very important phrase. I think, and I don't know how he meant it, but when when we talk about enlightenment and all this stuff, we're we're just kind of like sketching out this real crude map, you yes. know, which which may be quite dissimilar from the actual territory that it refers to. Exactly, and and what I have found is that both past and present gurus often don't know or realize existentially in the moment that the map is not the territory. Wilbur. Wilbur? Wilbur is an example of that. <laughs> I don't know. I can't I can't speak for Wilbur. But... The integral ma map? Uh-huh. Uh, or Kohen, for example, the evolutionary enlightenment. It's based on certain premises mm -hmm. like uh, the Big Bang and so on, but these are maps of physics that are continuously being re-shuffled. Yeah. And uh, they don't, Wilbur does not point out enough or, or at all that it's the map is not the territory. Mm -hmm. Like you got to pay $200 a DVD to go through stage one of the map, stage two of the map. There's all kinds of levels, lines, quadrants, mm. types. Uh, Maybe in one of his books he mentions the map's not the territory, but mm -hmm. that's just an example. He's huge uh, throughout the world. And oh, yeah, he's a very influential guy. Well, you know, if, if we look at those old maps that Columbus wrote, uh, drew or the pilgrims or, you know, early settlers or the, the Vikings or whatever, you see these very crude representations of what North America looks like. These days we have, you know, 
satellite photography that can you know see a cigarette pack on the ground it's all mapped out in very precise detail um, so I think any of these guys any guru as you as you call them is uh, in, mo in most cases just sketching out a map as to the best of their ability but the maps are evolving and both in, in, even in terms of them they them any individual his ability to sketch out a map is evolving, but perhaps we as a culture are improving our map making ability as we go along. Just to be a little bit more specific, when I talk about map, I'm talking about conceptual perceptual. Map. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or put it the other way, the perceptual conceptual map is not reality. Correct. It's only a pointer, and but that's what you know. We have to kind of do that. I mean, if we if we say the color red, which is obviously the color of my shirt. That's an agreed upon concept to refer to, you know, this particular spectrum of, of electro, uh, the electromagnetic, uh, you know, wavelength. And but we all kind of agree on what it means. So we're trying to agree upon and, and discuss. Uh, Rick, just, just a point there. Uh, uh, um, he wanted to say something. Try I'm sorry, it. Go ahead. You know, he said the red. Mm -hmm. like it's a red shirt. Mm -hmm. And the concept. <coughs> uh, you said the shirt's obviously red. Um, by sensory perceptual map, like how we mentioned sensory and conceptual, the perception that it's red, like the visual system, etc., that in itself is a map or a model. It's a translation. Exactly. A large, un, infinite or unlimited amount of energy or the territory, which is totality, gets translated into a map. That's, you could call it the first level of the map, and then the second level is the conceptual linguistic. And, and the book, to kind of weave this into the Sam Brooks's book, um, is a major deconstructor in that sense. It goes from level to level, the maps. Mm -hmm. A lot of it builds off of Alfred Korzybski. He's the guy that said, the map's not the territory. If you're familiar with Stephen Walensky, the disciple of uh, Nisargadot, mm -hmm. he was profoundly influenced by Korzybski as well. Oh. So it goes in to talk about how there's different levels of the map, meaning the sensory perceptual, what you see is red, and then the conceptual. And that all makes up what you call human. You know, it's called the delusion of being human. And then in, involved in that as well, weaved into those maps is basically the map makers or what's called the cultural social enterprise and cultural social conditioning, the specifics of conditioning, basically Pavlovian conditioning, avoiding to escape conditioning, all sorts of things from what's called learning theory and psychology. There's also all kinds of um, neuroscience in terms of how the photons come in and there's an abstraction of energy, but I just wanted to weave that in there. Sure. Um, and so, so that's a good, it's a little taste of some of the stuff that's in the book. Yeah. yeah. Are, are you aware, um, that, Rick, that, um, that what you see is color outside you it's not outside you. It's a sensation inside your neurology. Sure, it's something happening in the brain that you know that, that is interpreted as color or as as whatever. Yeah, and yeah. That, that are you also aware that there's nothing outside you? Yeah, if it, as long as we define you as in, in the big sense of it. Obviously, there's there, there's stuff outside this body. I mean, the Venus, the planet, is outside this body, is it not? But but what I essentially am contains both this body and Venus. No, you're constructing Venus. Through it's not outside you at all. Hmm. That's an interesting idea. Elaborate on that a little bit. Well, it's just just the old idea of you're creating or constructing is a better word because we seldom ever create anything. What we're doing is constructing neurological, neurologically, we're constructing all kinds of perceptual, conceptual maps, all kinds of them, through our various senses and through our ideational system. And then we project that outside because that seems to be the way it looks. But it doesn't it is not that way. It's not that way at all. 
but when I but when I mentioned Venus, you knew what I was talking about, and you and I have never talked about Venus before, because oh. you know everybody in the world has seen Venus, and astronomers you know have seen it in, in quite some detail. So there, it, it's and if and if everybody in the world died, which a hundred years from now everyone will have, and there'll be other people here, they'll be seeing Venus. So it's it's not like you know Venus is dependent for its existence on what you or I or anybody else understands. It has a sort of certain objective. Uh, reality to it, doesn't it? No objective at all. Uh, there is no such thing as objective. Um, there is subjective, but no object. <laughs> <laughs> what happens is, and it's the worst sin we ever commit, is we agree. Mm -hmm. We're always being run by agreement. And the agreement comes from the cultural social enterprise, which tells us that there is Venus out there. But notice that perception, if we see Venus that looks like it's outside of us, that's, that's our own perception. Perception has constructed that, and then the word Venus has also been constructed by our language. So, there's nothing outside of us. But if but I... Here, oh, go ahead. Here's the question. I mean, not the question, but here's a, here's a statement that goes with that. Where do... Where does us stop and begin? And if you know you're the only, you know there isn't any beginning, there isn't any end, there isn't any birth, there isn't any death. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want to add to that, Troy? Uh, I was just going to say the delusion is being human. Um, we all have... An, like your Venus and my Venus are different. I have, a, I, I construct a Venus. You construct a Venus. We both construct concepts of this thing that we've never actually, you know, seen close up. We we uh, have. From point of view, which is something Adi Da to bring our good buddy back, he uh, drew that out through what he often referred to point of view later on in his teaching. He brought in the neurological system more, the limits of it, and the sort of thing we're talking about. He used a metaphor of uh, totality or the territory as a room. Mm -hmm. He would say, to know the room as it is, meaning the only, to really be able to actually know it, you'd have to be able to see it from every single point of view in the room simultaneously, from all time and space. But we can't do that. We're limited to the point of view of our neur neurology. So you're if you're so, you're somewhere in the states right now and you look up at the sky and you see Venus, you're seeing the room from your point of view, and I'm seeing it from mine. It's limited, like yeah, we're like little peepholes, uh, in, in and you know we're only kind of getting some kind of approximation of of what's out there, and each peephole gives it a different color, a different flavor. Yeah, one of the statements that really hit me at the core when I was in a dialogical inquiry one time with a sign poster was he said uh, anything limited is unreal only the unlimited is real mm -hmm. um, and that's a major theme uh, yeah I like that hmm. well as always you know uh, when I do interviews I I feel like I'm scratching the surface which kind of fits right in with your map is not the territory theme I always feel like you know, we're kind of trying to have a conversation about something uh, with using concepts and words that is way beyond concepts and words. <laughs> and hopefully this is of some value for people. I, I feel like it's a value for me somehow just dwelling on this stuff and having these conversations. And people who listen and watch these shows seem to feel the same way. It somehow or other just engaging I don't know if this is if what we're doing here is what you would call dialogical inquiry but it um, it seems to have co some kind of effect when you engage in it yeah it's a, it's dialogical inquiry Rick hmm. and thank you for for entering into it yeah yeah I you know I sort of feel like we we could probably go on all afternoon uh, but you must be getting a little tired and and I don't want to bore people who are listening to this but it it's very interesting, and um, you know, I understand you have like a well, your book will be coming out, but you also have if if a person lives in your vicinity, there's a little group of twenty or thirty people that meets on a weekly basis with you or something. I heard you say. Yeah, it changes. 
it was as high as about 40 and it went back down to about eight. You know what you might consider doing? I, I was in a group like that for years uh, and we had a speaker phone in the room and people would call in from all over the country and kind of participate via this, this conference phone that we had in the room there. Uh, you might you know, want to consider doing something like that and uh, then people who listen to this show or anybody else whom you're in touch with could um, you know, engage with you that way. That's an interesting idea. I think Troy thought of that. Yeah. Doesn't too you can buy one of those used on eBay or whatever, not, not too expensive. You get the good ones that are shaped kind of like, you know, little arms that come out and they, and they really pick up the sound well. Okay. Yeah. Okay, guys. Well, uh, I thank you for this conversation. Um, do you have anything, that you any final statements you want to you make before we conclude? I only want to bow down before you. Oh, <laughs> I'll bow down before you. <laughs> I'm not worthy of bowing down before any more than any, anybody else is. Yep, you're forgetting fact, who you are. <laughs> in fact, you, you're my you're my uh, senior, so the the respect is all due to you. At least in the Indian tradition, you always bow before your elders. Uh, First Nations as well. Is it? You mean you mean like the Native Americans? Is that what you mean by First Nations? Yeah, yeah. There's some value in that. Okay, so let me make a concluding remark or two. Um, won't take long. I uh, this is an ongoing series of interviews, and uh, if you go to batgap.com, you'll find them all uh, archived, and they're also archived on the YouTube channel. And you can subscribe to the YouTube channel to be notified of new ones, or at batgap.com, there's a little tab that you can click on and and put your email address in, and whenever a new interview is posted, you'll be notified of it. There's also an audio podcast you can subscribe to, and a, a good, almost half the people who listen to this show just do it in audio. And so you'll see links to that with every interview on batgap.com. So it's an Apple you know, iPod or podcast thing. And also on batgap.com, there's a discussion group that crops up around every single interview. Each, each interview has its own little discussion. La the last week's one is up to about 150 people or so, 150 comments or so. And so if you feel inclined to say anything about this interview or to engage in a discussion about the things we've been talking about, go there and you just post something. You can be a, your own sign poster. <laughs> I did want to mention one thing now, um, come to think of it. Also, to build off what you're saying, if someone wants to ask any questions about something that was said in the interview or if they want to continue this dialogue, mm -hmm. they could add uh, Troy Aviz. I have Facebook. It's just T-R-O-Y. I'll, uh, yeah, I'll link to your Facebook page from, from backup.com so they can just click and go there if they want to talk to you, right? Or Skype. It's or free. Skype. I don't charge anyone for Skype. Okay. Troyaviz at gmail.com. Okay. That's email. Just Why don't you uh, send me all this stuff in an email, and I'll put it right there on the site. So uh, if you want, I'll put your Skype address and your email and your, your Facebook address, and people can all get in touch with you in those different ways. Yeah, and the sign poster goes through me because I'm – younger and I'm more familiar with technology so that's why I gave the choice sure okay so all that will be there on backgap.com just uh, go there if you'd like to get in touch with the sign poster or with Troy okay all right you bet. Thank, thank you thank you very much live long and prosper <laughs>